there is a spiritual game that you can play. It is used frequently in Advaita Hinduism, and that is quizzing each other, who are you? And they begin to answer, I'm a person, I'm a man, I'm a student, I'm... And you just keep on asking and do that for five minutes and then take turns and reverse roles. And you keep doing it remorselessly. And it has an astonishing effect. I remember what meant so much to me in experiencing that was when I came to say, finally, trying Joanna, trying a student trying a woman trying a treat just say i'm a watcher and how satisfying that felt welcome back to we are the great turning a podcast with me Jess Sarante and a great watcher who also goes by the name Joanna Macy this is episode nine of our 10-part series. And in this episode, we move on to the final stage of the spiral of the work that reconnects, going forth. Going forth is about action. As we travel the spiral from gratitude to honoring our pain to seeing with new eyes, we filled ourselves with inner resources like love, courage, wisdom, joy, and connection. And now as we go forth, Our task is to use those resources in service to our world, to go forth and build the Great Turning. In episode three, we talked about how the Great Turning is a paradigm shift, a global movement that's building a more just and life-sustaining society. We want life to go on. We want to give ourselves to life going on. But how exactly do we do this? For the longest time, I felt frustrated when I got to the going forth part of the spiral. I wanted someone to tell me, me, Jess, what I should do. And I wanted a clear map out of this mess for the whole world. The modern Western ideal of leadership often demands that our leaders impose certainty onto the inevitable chaos of our world. We ask them to know the unknowable and confidently guarantee solutions to our problems, to spare the rest of us from the pain of uncertainty. Something that I love about Joanna as a leader is that she doesn't do this. She doesn't try to protect us or herself from not knowing. Our world, the world as we know it, sounds like it might die on us. Okay? How are we supposed to... We've never lost a planet. We don't have any experience in the source of life drying up. There's no preparation for this. We don't even know how to imagine it. We're trying to pin down and have answers for something that is, by its nature, it is of spontaneity and, and cannot be ordered Joanna doesn't offer a one-size-fits-all formula for how we build the great turning. But that doesn't stop me from asking her. My desire for answers can be so strong at times that it's become a joke between the two of us. Like, I want a prescription because it's so uncomfortable. Well, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. You know, and then once you've uh, express that prescription to somebody. You know, say, <laughs> how does that feel? You know, it might be just what the situation calls for. <laughs> but as I, uh, but the, you don't. It's just so. Let's let's talk about spontaneity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm laughing as I say that because now I can. It's just. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. I'm robbed of my <laughs> my desire for the prescription even. It's not that clean. I know it's not that clean. I want I want it to feel understandable how to stay sane with the world burning around us. 
I think it has something to do with her 50 plus years of Buddhist practice. But one of the things that I so deeply admire about Joanna as a teacher is her willingness to say what she does not know and to stay with me as I struggle with these questions myself. One day at her table, I was talking with Joanna about a protest I was a part of a few years ago in New York, where we shut down one of the major traffic arteries in the city during rush hour. Our goal was to bring awareness to a serious piece of climate legislation that was being blocked in Congress. While I was sitting in the middle of the road, locked to my comrades, an angry man whose car was blocked pulled a crowbar from his trunk and threatened me with it. And he'd be almost willing to take a life. So it's, there's, there's a kind of kerfluey. There, there's a kind of madness. It's a madness. Mm -hmm. As we talked about the intensity of that moment, I told Joanna how sad I feel when fighting climate change creates hateful interactions like the one I had with this guy with the crowbar. And Joanna's response was to tell me about that game you heard her describe at the top of the episode. The one where she said, I'm a watcher. Because if I'm a watcher of this situation, I'm not denying it. I'm not trying to stop it. I'm not trying to assign blame. I'm not fighting it. But I'm just taking it in. This was a record scratch moment for me. Don't we need to fight it, though, if we're going to do something? Is doing something requiring that we fight it? Oh, well, that's a good question. Joanna said no. She actually said if we fight climate change... Then we're sunk. Why? Because to fight something like that sustains it. To fight something ends up hooking you to it in some way. Yeah. And it's an enemy relationship. And an inimical relationship can never quiet something into non-existence. It somehow uh, morphs gradually into a dependence. Does that make sense? Somehow we become dependent on that which we must destroy. We must show that we are stronger, wiser, purer. And it ties us in some way that weakens us and distorts our fundamental nature. To be honest, this was hard for me to hear at first. To me, activism has long meant identifying an enemy and then fighting them in order to win justice. Joanna has helped me see, though, that the great turning is actually so much more than that. She teaches that there are three dimensions of the great turning. Three essential, interdependent ways that we can act in service of the future we want. She calls them, first, holding actions. Second, transforming the foundations of our common life. And third, creating a shift in consciousness. Katie Long and Don Haney from the Buddhist Peace Fellowship created their own framework for talking about some very similar concepts, which they call block, build, be. Block, harmon, and justice. Build, community, and new ways of living. And be, or embody the love and liberation we want for the world within ourselves. My entry point into the climate movement was through blocking, or what Joanna calls holding actions. Starting in college, I worked on corporate accountability campaigns that attempted to stop big companies from harming people and destroying the land. Over the years, I've literally blocked bank entrances, pipeline construction sites, and highways like that day in New York. Blocking can also include things like boycott and divestment movements, protest marches, whistleblowing, or offering sanctuary to someone at risk of deportation. 
these kinds of actions protect lives and land from immediate threats. They defend what we love. But as I've learned for myself and seen in so many of my collaborators, the confrontation that's an inevitable part of blocking can wear on us and burn us out. We can see this so clearly now where uh, our country is going almost berserk with what it's doing to people and the natural world and the balance of life through our insistence on dominance. Yeah. When you put it that way, I can start to see it more clearly, what you've been saying, that that to fight is to assert dominance, and you can see it in play in American politics right now, that is, it is a battle for superiority that has us like two bucks with locked horns. Like those bucks, it's easy to get caught in an unconscious battle where we might get ahead for a minute, but we're forever trapped in the struggle to get and stay on top. With an enemy, you must destroy that enemy. And that entangles us in a mutual grip. That's when the antlers get jammed together. So this feels like a bit of a Zen koan to me, like a riddle. How do we block the harms of business as usual without replicating its violence and separation? How do we do it without getting our horns locked or burning ourselves out? Blocking can be risky business. Safety is never guaranteed when confronting violent systems. But I think it's dangerous to believe that we need to give our lives for what we love, whether that means sacrificing our physical bodies or our mental health. Instead, as South African climate leader Kumi Naidu has said, we need to live to give the rest of our lives to what we love. After eight years in the movement, I left my organizing job and went to grad school to study urban planning and climate resilience. This is the second dimension of the great turning. Building, or as Joanna calls it, transforming the foundations of our common life. Building replaces the destructive ways of business as usual with new ways of living that are just and life-sustaining. It's things like land trusts, child care cooperatives, localized renewable energy projects, truth and reconciliation commissions, and restorative justice initiatives. But these essential transformations risk being challenged, overturned, co-opted, and undermined when we're still in the business-as-usual mindset. So to sustain them, we need the third dimension of the great turning, creating a shift in consciousness, being. It's things like learning from indigenous leaders about how we can live in harmony with each other and the land, examining and dismantling our unconscious biases, cultivating connection with the earth and our neighbors, and making art and music that touches our hearts and connects us more deeply with the kind of world we long for. While I was in grad school, I discovered that what lights me up the most is spending my days supporting movement leaders through coaching and facilitation. I help these leaders to believe in themselves, to lead with integrity, to sustain themselves in their work and chase their dreams for a better world. I see it as both building and being work. So when I lay down my need for a prescription, I can see that how I contribute to the great turning has been constantly evolving. And I expect that it will continue to do so over the rest of my life. As I was making this episode, I listened back many, many times to the conversation where I begged Joanna to give me the prescription for how we build the great turning. Like, I want a prescription because it's so uncomfortable. Well, go ahead. <laughs> And I realized that in that conversation, I was so desperate for Joanna to tell me the answer that I was discounting my own answers. Even as I begged her to spell it out for me, I told Joanna what I think I need to do. I want to sit down for once and be like, Joanna, 
tell me the answer and for you to be like, here it is, Jess. <laughs> here. You need to play. You need to feel your grief. <laughs> you need to act and remember how much you love the earth. And that's how we're going to make it through. This is so funny to me in retrospect. Without realizing it, I had named to her many of the things I've learned from her and my years of activism about what I can do. I was so afraid of what I don't know that I totally discounted what I do. I was desperately looking outside of myself for answers that I already had within. I think a lot of us do this to ourselves. And it's no accident that part of the answer I was seeking came out of my own mouth while I was talking to a beloved friend. We often find the best versions of ourselves in the presence of people who love us. When climate movement leader Bill McKibben is asked what we can do as individuals to address the climate crisis, he often says, stop being an individual. While each of us gets to forge our own winding path as builders of the great turning, Joanna is very clear that no matter what we do, we must do it together. Is there any substitute for gathering people together, generating the solidarity to trust each other, and the appetite to do something together? And, and a sense of uh, being a team and the fun and satisfaction that are unleashed uh, when you undertake doing something together for something that matters. It's just, it's the best thing. There's nothing better than that. Then all kinds of things occur. This is the closest to a prescription I've ever gotten from Joanna. Gather together, build joyful, loving relationships of solidarity, and trust the creative possibilities that emerge from those relationships. As long as we lead with community, courage, and creativity, the sky's the limit. Building a great turning means expanding our sense of self looking out beyond ourselves and remembering that the climate crisis is inherently a justice problem. It threatens every aspect of life, from job security to democracy to food and water security and the survival of all of our non-human kin, the bees, trees, oceans, and so much more. And this means that every single place where we come together, from places of worship, to businesses of all kinds, to schools and our neighborhood streets, can be places where we can work together to build microcosms of the great turning. Now, of course, coming together can often be messy and complex, but there may be no more important, gratifying, or beautiful challenge for us to take on. Our relationships are the bricks that the temple of the great turning is made of. There are some questions that I suspect I'll be asking for a long time, maybe for the rest of my life. And perhaps, as Joanna did at the beginning of the episode, you might be asking yourself, who am I? How do I contribute to the great turning? How do we learn to come together? How do we sustain ourselves on the uncertain road we walk? Joanna is a longtime translator of the poetry of the great German poet Rainier Maria Rilke. And there's a passage from his letters to a young poet that sheds a light on how to be with big questions like these. Don't try to find the answers now. They cannot be given anyway because you cannot be able to live them. For everything is to be lived. Live the questions now. Perhaps you then may gradually, without noticing, one day in the future, live into the answers. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to episode nine of We Are the Great Turning. The next episode will be the last in this series. As we complete this journey around the spiral together, we'll prepare to go forth to bring the lessons and gifts from this journey out into the world. I want to say how uh, grateful I am for you. You have so much living ahead of you. So if I can participate at all in what you can draw on, it will be to show that you have all humanity and the future being the past beings too. We have a web we can draw on. The wise ones have tried to tell us this. Thanks for listening to We Are The Great Turning. This show is free for everyone, made possible by our generous donors. If you'd like to, you can make a donation at wearethegreatturning.com. There, you could also find our toolkit with discussion prompts, guided exercises, and more to bring the insights from this podcast deeper into your life. We build the great turning by talking and acting together. So please consider sharing these episodes with someone you love or forming a podcast club and going through the exercises in the toolkit together. This episode, we have a bonus for you. It's a guided exercise designed to help you practice the work that reconnects with the people in your life. You can find the link to that bonus episode in your podcast app. We'd love your feedback. So send us a note or a voice message at greatturning at soundstrue.com. You can find me on Instagram at Jess underscore Cerrante, S-E-R-R-A-N-T-E, and at JessCerrante.com. This show is brought to you by the Sounds True Foundation. Thank you to our team at Sounds True, especially Tammy Simon and Fernie Tiflis. Our show's producer is Anya Kamenetz. Our audio producer and engineer is Luce Fleming. Our editorial consultant is Anna Sale. Thank you to Rising Appalachia for the use of their songs Resilient, Catalyst, and Novels of Acquaintance. Thank you to all of our generous donors who made this podcast possible. Christopher Hormel, The Best Family Foundation, The Calliopeia Foundation, Barbara Ford, Polly Howells, Linnea Lombard, Kathleen Sullivan, Blaise Dupuy, Miju Han, Gideon Wald, and everyone who contributed to our GoFundMe. Special thanks to Ann Simons Booker, Peggy Macy, Stephanie Caza, Jeremy Blanchard, Lucy Boucher, Jesse Marshall, Dan Couch, Paula Sanchez Abreu, Lindley Meese, and Michelle Ripka. I want to offer my deepest gratitude to Joanna Macy for her profound friendship and extraordinary generosity and wisdom. It has been the honor of my life to make this podcast with you. We've done probably like 20 recording sessions. <laughs> Some 15, 20 by now. We didn't want to stop. No, and I still don't want to stop. That's right.